Hello and hi everyone, I'm Carly and this is Denver Zoo's Zoo to You Virtual Safari. We are in our Animal Ambassador Animal Housing today in the Gates Building and we're really excited to compare and contrast some amphibians. Yesterday we did a gigantic mammal with Rudy, our black rhino. So we're scaling back a little bit, going a little smaller, going a little bit different in the taxonomy. So we're really excited for that. I'll wait for a few more people to join us before we get started. I hope everyone likes my hump day camel mask, even personalized with my name. So thank you to Amanda, our giraffe keeper who made this for me. So we're really excited to get started. We're gonna take you through three different amphibians today, talk about adaptations, what they eat, diet, and I hope you all kind of learn something new today. I know, I know critters aren't everyone's favorite, but I've certainly learned a lot by doing these. So let's get started. All right, we're starting with Shannon. Hi there, guys. Um, I'm here to talk about my favorite amphibian that we have in our collection. This is Thomas, or Prince Thomas, as we like to call him, because he is a little prince, and he is a Woodhouse's toad. So Woodhouse's toads can be found right here in our own backyards. They're sort of in the central uh, United States area. So this is something you could find if you go out um, hiking, exploring uh, by a body of water is a Woodhouse's toad, like Thomas. So Woodhouse's toads, like all amphibians, they have a permeable skin, which means they take in water and different things through their skin. So unlike ours, which protects us from anything getting into our bodies, their skin allows it to go like pass right in and out through their skin. So they need to be around water uh, or else they would like dry up. <laughs> Thomas is giving us a little wave here. Oh yes. He's the most personable of all of our frogs, charismatic, I would say. He's always up at the glass. I like to take pictures of us like holding him through. Good, sexy. <laughs> I hope everyone has a really nice clear shot of his face and his eyes there. So is this as big as Thomas will get? Yes, this is as big as he's gonna get. He is fully grown. Um, so another thing we get with uh, Thomas being a Woodhouse's toad is what's the difference between a frog and a toad? Absolutely, what is the difference? Well, um, anatomically, not really anything, or taxonomically, not really anything. Um, all frogs and toads are frogs, but not all um, frogs are toads. So toads, um, you typically have wartier, bumpier skin. Uh, they look a little bit drier than uh, frogs, and their legs are a little bit shorter. Um, he's not very good at jumping. They crawl more than they really hop for long distances. So that's one way you can tell frogs and toads apart. Very cool. I know Lala, she lives in New Mexico. Is this a toad she might find in her area? Uh, I do believe so, yes. Very cool. So it might be something you've actually seen outside Lala, and it is a species you can find here in Colorado too. He is so hoppy today he um is. he does know it's wednesday so i can give him some of his favorite treats oh my gosh who wants to see for. some treats oh, oh. I'm gonna, okay. you get that cricket away from me I'm shannon not very <laughs> so we're dropping so some crickets in there yeah so amphibians like to eat insects he's such a little he little camera ham really likes people i mean he will sort of react when we come by which is why i like him so much um, cause you wouldn't think an amphibian really would react to people or care about people walking by his tank, but he does. He knows he's got a lot of people watching our virtual safari <laughs> right now. Yes. He wants to prove he's the best amphibian oh. of the ambassador team. We have, we have a, a loose cricket, right? Oh no, he found the escape hatch. Right huh? here? <laughs> I'm going to keep an eye on that myself. <laughs> so, uh, Maria wants to know if he makes noises. So they do make noises. So male frogs, uh, to attract the ladies, oh. will actually make a chirping sound. Um, so Woodhouse's toads, the sound has been compared to a sheep bleeding. Um, so all frog species have different sounds, um, whether it's like how many like chirps in a specific call or how loud or the sound of it. So female frogs don't get confused. They know which species is whose and they find it very attractive for the loudest call. So they usually go for that. <laughs> oh, very cool. What else do you like about Woodhouse's toads? Oh goodness. 
what is until like about which houses so so they are here in Colorado um, so they can hibernate through the winters sort of hibernate uh, so they'll you know dig underground and sort of go into sort of a hibernation thing where they won't eat and then when it's warm enough again they'll come back out very very cool do they come in any other colorations or is this sort of gray brown with the very light belly what you'd find um, with them typically yes um the females are supposed to have a different color throat than the male hmm. uh, but i haven't worked with a female so interesting well i guess yeah. that kind of answers our next question from char she wants to know do we breed them i'm um, not here <laughs> not to say that other zoos and aquariums <laughs> don't um are they endangered are they threatened so i would say that a lot of our amphibian species are threatened um, just because of changing habitats and since their skin is so permeable they're a really good um, indicator of water pollution and other things like that uh, so they're very sensitive to changes in their habitats uh, and there are some diseases that are uh, passable with frogs but such as chytrid so as of right now they're not like on the endangered species list but amphibians are definitely one of those ones we want to watch out for in the future Absolutely. Okay. A couple more questions and we'll go on to our next keeper and amphibian. Uh, Emily wants to know how many wood houses toads do we have here at Denver Zoo? Um, Thomas is the only one that we have here with us currently. Um, so he's very uh, special and very yes, unique. He here. is our little prince and we treat him <laughs> like one. <laughs> Nate loves enrichment. He loves to know what we do for enrichment and I assume amphibians or toads don't really have toys or boomer balls or anything so what would be considered enrichment for thomas um so for our amphibians what we would do would be to uh, redecorate their houses <laughs> so um these guys will explore uh they are nocturnal when houses toad so i mean he does seem very active during the day <laughs> with all of us um so i assume he's even more active at night but giving him different things to explore to climb in you might be able to see this fun moss house ball that we got him, his little hobbit house, I call it. I absolutely love it when I find him in there in the morning. Um, so stuff like that, different things to explore, different pools, uh, stuff to climb on. And certainly feeding, having and to get his feeding. live food. Yes, exactly. Is one as well. Exercise that way. Uh, Lala wants to know how small they are when they're, when they've just, either are they hatched or born? Yes, so um, amphibians, uh, typically they all have eggs. Uh, not the typical egg that you would think of with like a bird egg. Uh, these guys have little jelly eggs. So they have to be laid in or around bodies of water because they don't have a shell to protect them. So those little jelly eggs will hatch and either land in the water or hatch into the water and they are little tiny tadpoles. So it depends on the species how big or small the tadpole is when it hatches. Um, but they'll spend a few weeks as a tadpole and then they'll slowly uh, metamorphize mm. into frogs. So they'll grow their legs, they'll lose their gills, and they come onto the land. Very, very cool. I'm trying to get some, we've seen a lot of Thomas's belly, so I wanted to show people yeah. his kind of warty back. And um, then Emily wants to know how old is he? How old is he? Let me just quick see what, if he has his birthday on there, because if not. <laughs> um, I don't know off the top of my head when he came out of his little jelly egg. <laughs> It is tough. We have a lot of animal yeah, ambassadors. He's been with us at least for 10 years. Wow. Okay. He's a big guy. He's an, he's an older guy. Yes, he is an older guy. <laughs> um, if you were able to see the back, you might have seen also his um, per paratoid glands. Um, so some frogs, uh, obviously, they don't have any teeth or fangs to defend themselves. So some of them actually secrete um, toxic uh, substances out of different pores in their body. So, uh, Woodhouse's toads do have that. Oops. <laughs> He's like, where did my camera go? <laughs> um, so, they're sort of behind his eye. It's sort of that bigger looking wart oh, right there. Okay. All right. So, yeah, if he were to feel threatened, um, he could secrete stuff from those to make himself taste very bad and make the predator sick. Yuck. Well, we're not threatening him. He doesn't need to secrete anything right now. He's a very special guy. But we're gonna say bye to Thomas. We're gonna drop one. <laughs> one more cricket. Oh dear. Oh no. I lost. No, there's a couple loose ones in there I'm anyway. Sorry. He'll get he'll get his food now that he has no camera. Yeah. To Next we have Holly. Hi, Hi Holly. And who's this? We've got Littlefoot. 
Um, so Littlefoot is actually set up. So these guys can be found on in most parts of the country, but here in Colorado, they're pretty common, um, and that's why he's a state amphibian. So as you can see about his body shape, comparing him to Thomas, salamanders are shaped very differently than frogs and toads. They've got an elongated body, really short, stubby um, uh, legs, and a really, really long tail. So these guys live in similar habitats, but they do different things. So first I want you to notice the colorations that he has on his body, the striping, the patterns. That's how he gets his name, tiger salamander. Sometimes they can be a lot brighter, really bright, bright yellow. And that's kind of a warning coloration to say, hey, I might be poisonous, so maybe you should leave me alone. Oh. So, um, and then it also, as you can see with the moss around him, it does help him to camouflage as well. So kind of a, 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 kind of a dual benefit there. He's so handsome, he's so still. Is that one of his sort of defense, you know, to stay very still? Yeah, so a small um, animal like this, they can definitely be a prey species. So one form of defense is to hide, burrow, um, move away quickly from something that they might uh, deem a threat. But yeah, just being still and blending in is definitely a defense that they might do. So here's a little close up of, of little foot. Sorry if there's a bit of a connection drop yeah, out looks here. Like he's moving over. So Ooh. these guys can actually secrete a slight toxin um, similar to Thomas that could make a predator kind of sick. So sometimes animals have those warning colorations because they definitely have something that might make another animal sick. Doesn't make us sick. We can touch them and handle him. Um, and then sometimes amphibians, it's like a ruse. They kind of just mimic <laughs> other poisonous animals, but they aren't really poisonous. But he actually will secrete something that's a tastes kind of bad. I saw him kind of flick his eye. Does he blink or kind of what what does he do there? Yeah, the next thing I want you guys to notice about those eyes is notice that they're kind of on the top of his head. These guys are excellent hunters. And like Shannon was talking about with the metamorphosis that amphibians go through, which what separates them from reptiles, one of the many things that separates them from reptiles, these guys spend their time in the water as they're developing in their larval stage. And what they'll do for hunting is they kind of will sit at the top of that water with those eyes perked out of the water and then hunt bugs on the top. And they'll also do that on land. Once they move on to land um, out of the water, they'll use those eyes, they'll kind of bury themselves and all that'll be sticking up are those two tiny eyes and that's when they'll snatch up a bug. Bugs are definitely their favorite food. Um, and these guys are also unique too because when they're in their younger stages, they actually are cannibals and will eat other tiger salamanders, which is fairly unique. Wow, so you mentioned the larval stage, yes. and you actually had the opportunity to see a tiger salamander in its larval stage guys, this weekend, didn't you? Yeah, guys, I encourage you guys to go out and try to find amphibians, explore your environment, try to find really great critters like this, because I was hiking near Basalt, Colorado this weekend, and we were in an, an alpine lake, and I just took this picture two days ago. We were lucky enough to see hundreds and hundreds of larval tiger salamanders. So what you're seeing here are the gills. So just like fish, they have these gills that um, are off the sides of their face. And what gills do is they help process the oxygen in the water so that they can breathe underwater. So when they're in this stage, they are fully aquatic. And then eventually these go away. Um, and then they, as you can see with him, he doesn't have any anymore and he's uh, fully breathes air outside of the water. So um, this is the first time for me as a biologist to see these in the wild. So it was very, very exciting. Um, so these are here right in Colorado, which is so cool. And a great photo. Maria wants to know, can they lose their tail when attacked and can it grow back? Yes. So actually scientists are studying salamanders because their regenerative regenerative properties, there's the word, um, are so spectacular. Now he's moving. And they say that some salamanders can actually regrow their limbs up to 18 to 20 times, which is fascinating. Um, so they are being studied for that to see, um, you know, how, how the heck they can do that. It's just so, so neat. He looks like he's like wet. Is that just the appearance of his skin? So he is a little bit wet, but this is um, typical appearance of a salamander skin, so very, very smooth and slimy. Another thing that separates them from reptile, that smooth and slimy skin. And so that, that skin does need to stay moist. Um, it's actually not very wet right now, but it just kind of has that glassy appearance. 
Hi, Ashley. She says the larvae looks kind of like an axolotl, apart yes. from the color, which is exactly what I said when I saw the photo. So very good observation. Can you tell people what an axolotl is? Yes, an axolotl looks almost exactly like that, even similar in size. They're often found in Mexico, and axolotls never lose those gills, so they are fully aquatic forever. But what I have read in tiger salamanders that makes them similar to the axolotl is that sometimes if there is enough food in the water, they may not lose these and they may just stay in that water and keep them like an axolotl would. Very good comparison. If you have um, kids who've done our summer safari camp, you might have had them come home wearing an axolotl yeah. shirt and probably were like, what is that? I expected an animal I'd recognize on my camper shirt. So very cool. What is your favorite thing about Littlefoot here? His personality. Um, <laughs> so these guys are very voracious eaters. I'll, kind of, I'll, show, I'll feed him one of his favorite snacks too, which also happen to be crickets. Um, so we actually like to hand feed him sometimes. So you'll see the movement. You should take it right Ooh. up. Oh my gosh, that was a blink and you'll miss it type feeding. <laughs> yeah. So this is a typical size for a salamander. Um, but there are some salamanders, the giant salamander in Asia, Japan, I think it is, they can actually get to be around 140 pounds and about six feet long. Does he have teeth? Are you worried about getting snapped by him when he does that? Oops. These guys don't really have teeth. I know that some newts, a, a relative of a salamander, have defined teeth. Um, they might have some kind of ridges in there to hold on to, but no, no defined teeth. There are about 500 different oh. species of salamander. And actually, um, if you guys have ever been lucky enough to go to the Smoky Mountain National Park, they have more species of salamander there than all of Europe. Very cool. They got about 30 different species. How many of these will he get a day? He it gets fed about three times a week and he gets three crickets at each feeding. So they don't need a ton of food to survive. Um, but he will get, he will eat as many as we give him, but we gotta watch his weight. <laughs> that is very, how, how much does he weigh? It's a great follow up. How much in grams? I'm trying to remember the last time I weighed him. I want to say 140. 140 grams. So it's basically like, like a handful of grapes. A handful of grapes. So that's all little foot is. I can like hear the cricket bag yeah. over it. <laughs> Sounds like rain on like your window. It's, it's odd. So one thing I'll leave you guys with is that these guys are common in a lot of habitats. So I found them up in a, in a montane lake all the way at about 10,000 foot elevation, but they're found in grasslands, prairie, and you can often sometimes find them in like your window wells because it's nice and moist in there. So they can be found in a variety of habitats. And if you find them, sometimes that coloration is shocking. People think they're an escaped exotic pet. And so they'll take them to the Reptile Humane Society thinking, what is this thing? But now you know that this is a native species and they're our state amphibian. Um, being this close and like at his level, can they leap or jump? Yeah, so he'll definitely leap for, especially for bugs. Um, but I wouldn't say it's very high. <laughs> yeah. That's good to know. Hi, Eric. Um, you're looking at... Littlefoot, our tiger salamander, we just did a Woodhouse's toad. These are animal ambassador species. So these live with our ambassador team. Sometimes they go out on programs. So hopefully you'll be able to see someone like Thomas or Littlefoot when you come to the zoo um, as one of our kind of like pop-up demonstrations. So no, they're not in Tropical Discovery. So we're gonna say bye to Holly. Thank okay. you so much. And we're gonna go over to Katie. He's got a big boy over here. I brought our largest amphibian. <laughs> so this is Zambezi. And Zambezi is an African bullfrog, which is one of the largest species of frog, not only here at Denver Zoo, but in the world. In the world. So third largest, if I'm um, remembering my facts correctly, <laughs> that there's only two other species that are bigger. So, and Zambezi is a male bullfrog. So he is very large. Unlike a lot of other frog species, the males are bigger than the females. So usually the females are um, larger. They're the ones that have to carry the eggs before they lay them and such. Um, but in this species, it's, they're unique with the males being larger. And that's because they're actually really good dads. Oh. And they protect the eggs and the tadpoles. Super unique within the amphibian world. Um, so what happens is in their native environment of Africa, the females will lay the eggs and then take off. And the male stays around and he protects those eggs from predators. So those eggs could be preyed on by a lot of different species because they're really small and vulnerable. 
So this big guy would stay around and protect those eggs. And then once those eggs hatch into tadpoles, he sticks around, makes sure they have enough water even. If the puddle or pond that they are living in is starting to dry up, which is very plausible in um, the dry African heat, these males will actually use their strong back legs to dig a trench to another body of water for the tadpoles to be able to survive. So that is why the males of the species are much larger because they're really good dads that protect their eggs and tadpoles. I'll tell you what, I wouldn't want to mess with him. Uh, you know, <laughs> I get it. Uh, Eric wants to know, is Zambezi poisonous? Um, they are not poisonous, no, not that I know of. Um, they, are, they use their size to protect them along with their very, very large mouths that actually have teeth-like protrusions. So unlike Thomas, who we talked about not really having teeth, or tiger salamanders not really having teeth, Zambezi, you wanna take a look at that, has these protrusions from the, his lower jaw that are quite sharp, and so he can use those to defend himself. What is that that he's eating there? Um, that would be a mouse. <laughs> so when you normally think of frogs, salamanders, you definitely think of them eating insects like crickets and flies. Well, Zambezi as an African bullfrog could definitely eat insects, but in the wild, they tend to eat larger prey like other amphibians, so other frogs, um, they'll eat small reptiles, even birds and small mammals. So here at the zoo, Zambezi gets an adult mouse every once every two weeks once every two weeks and that's all he needs to that's eat all he needs to eat if we fed him smaller things like insects which he would probably be happy to eat um he, we would probably feed him more often if he was eating smaller things but the fact that he eats an entire mouse it lasts for a long time and gives him enough energy for a long time i know our viewers have to have some questions about zambezi <laughs> and african bullfrog so we'll wait for them to get curious because i certainly have a lot. He kind of is, is like jelly looking, like oh slime, the way he, he moves feel, around. He feels like it too. He is really squishy. Um, we, we kind of jokingly call him Jabba the Hutt. <laughs> um, but really cool thing about these guys as well is the um, region they live in the world is Southern Africa and they like to live in grasslands. That area of the world is very, very hot and dry. So like Shannon and Holly both said, an amphibian skin does need moisture. So these guys have a special way of surviving the dry season, which in this part of the world is most of the year. Mm -hmm. So they will actually spend a majority of their lives underground. Very so cool. So they can use those really strong back legs to dig underground, and then they form a cocoon with dead layers of their outer skin that hardens around them to hold in the moisture so they don't dry out. And they can spend months and months and months, even up to years, depending on the weather, underground. And once it starts raining, that will soften that cocoon up and they will come out for the rainy season. Very cool. Emily wants to know, is he a full grown adult? He is. So Zambezi has been here at the zoo for about nine years and he was actually almost full grown when he got here. So he is probably at least 10 years old. Um, Maria wants to know, how big is their natural territory? And so this is a map of Africa. And you can see that orange going down there from the southern part in South Africa, stretching all the way up through Central and West, uh, Western Africa, or Eastern, is their natural territory. So it's a really big habitat. Yep, and like I said, grassland areas are where they're most prevalent. So in the rainy season, those kind of turn into temporary floodplains. So that's where they find the water to be able to breed and survive during the rainy season. Do we know the conservation status of the African bullfrog? They are of least concern, so um, they, their populations are okay, but like Shannon said, amphibians are um, sensitive to their environments. They're indicator species because of their sensitive skin, so they do need clean water and um, a healthy environment. So we call them an indicator species because if the environment's starting to get unhealthy, the amphibians are kind of the first to go. Um, so that if there's no amphibians in an area, it kind of tells us that it's not the most healthy environment. So, but as far as populations, their populations in Africa are still healthy. Now the questions are rolling in. Brienne wants to know, how much does he weigh? Oh, Zambezi weighs about a kilogram, which is 2.2 pounds. Um, and he does fluctuate with all this squishiness. <laughs> Amphibians can fluctuate a lot with water weight because um, they can absorb water through their skin. And so they can fluctuate a lot, but he's usually around a kilogram. 
um, 2.2 pounds, and this males can get up to four pounds. Wow. Yeah. He's not really showing us his belly, but from here I can see that he's got some yellows and oranges on it. Yeah, so his throat and a little bit along the sides in his belly are brightly colored yellow and orange, and that is um, true of males. The females will not have that same coloration. They'll be more cream colored. More cream colored. So I guess that's always a good way because I think a lot of people are always wondering how do we sex our amphibians and how do we tell who's who. Yeah, so many species of amphibians are sexually dimorphic, which means there are differences between the males and females. Um, that can be size, that can be coloration. Um, like I said before, the, um, the sexual dimorphism in this species is actually kind of backwards because usually in frogs, females are bigger than males. Um, but in this case, the males are quite a bit larger than females. Maria wants to know, do they have a breeding season? How often do they breed? Yeah, so it all depends on weather with these guys because they only come out for the rainy season. Um, they can go, like, like I said, about 10 months underground, I think is pretty normal. And then coming out for, um, the rainy season for two months. Um, so that would be their breeding season is during that rainy, um, uh, rainy time that they would, um, breed and females can lay up to 4,000 eggs. Wow. Uh, uh, Lydia wants to know what are their predators? We talked about what they prey on, but does anything prey on them? Oh, yes, for sure. They're definitely an edible size. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't know specifically which animals like would seek out an African bullfrog, birds. but hmm? birds. birds, yeah, definitely large birds. Um, but basically anything bigger than him is susceptible to being yeah. a predator. <laughs> Brian says, how long has it been since he had his last mouse? He actually gets it today. So we, we thought about showing it to yeah. you, but we just we decided, you know, it's not for everyone yes. <laughs> to watch a frog eat a mouse. So after this, we will reward him for being a Facebook star with a mouse. <laughs> uh, Luke wants to know why they are called the bullfrog. Um, I believe because of the sound they make. So they have kind of a really low bellow that they um, that they emit, especially during breeding season, to attract females. Um, but it, I believe that is how they get their name is from that bellow. And perhaps maybe they're just so big. <laughs> and they're giants. <laughs> they're, they're, they're just big, big, big guys. Um, Eric says, are they solitary or do they take a mate? Um, they are solitary, but during the breeding season, they have a lot of other males to compete with. Mm. So all, a bunch of males kind of all come together at a water source and compete for kind of an area. They wanna to get to the center of the group. So the biggest males end up getting to the center of that group. And then the females swim up from below to the center of the group to find those biggest males and um, choose one to breed with. Wow. Uh, hi, Eric. We're not gonna feed the mouse live. We might record it and figure out a way to bring it to you all later, but that way people can choose to watch it and they know what they're getting themselves into instead of being like, oh my gosh, we're, we're feeding a mouse live on Facebook. So I think that's it for questions. Lorraine says, cute face. I agree. All of our amphibians have super cute faces. Eric says, it sounds like a battle royale with the breeding. You bet. <laughs> breeding season. So that's going to be it for us today. Thank you so much to Katie and Holly and Shannon. Thank you to all you viewers. Uh, just as a reminder, there are more tickets available on DenverZoo.org. We can offer more of those time slots and those dates for you all who have been waiting to get back here to the zoo. So we really appreciate your patience, and we hope you can snag a ticket and come see us. And maybe you'll see one of these awesome amphibians during a little pop-up demo throughout the zoo during your visit. So thank you all for your questions. Hope you all learned something really important about amphibians today. They are an indicator species, so what happens to them eventually could happen to us. So keep your eye on them and appreciate your amphibians. I will see you all later. Bye.